Welcome to Brainstorm 9000. Hello, Internet, and welcome to another episode of Brainstorm 9000. I decided to kind of go lighter with it because right. I've been doing the right. Brainstorm 9000. Okay. So, Brainstorm 9000. Okay. As always, I'm here with Dr. Schultz. Yes. And today we decided to unlock the most secretive secret of the universe because people have been asking whether any of the names that Master McMaster, <laughs> who is sitting across from me, is real. Listen, she has master's degree in philosophy. Step one, master. Right. And her real, real last name is McMaster. Step two, McMaster. So last Master name. McMaster, okay? Yeah, that, that's my name. Don't wear it out. No, McMaster is a real last name. It's, it's Scottish. Do you like scotch? No, I'm more of a whiskey person. I, I know I'm like kind of betraying my country. Do you like beer? I like, I mean, anything that's alcoholic, I'll drink it. <laughs> Perfume. Oh, shit. Yeah, no. Sorry, you got me there. I won't do that. Okay, so you are not Russian. All right. <laughs> <laughs> On this beautiful note, uh, and you know, we are joking so much because the episode is actually very gloomy and grim. Uh, it has to do with suicide, uh, and uh, I was very fortunate uh, to reconnect with uh, Dr. Igor Galenker, who basically taught me at least 50% of all I know when I was in residency training at Beth Israel Medical Center. He has a very impressive credentials, and I asked Master McMaster to read them out loud without an accent. Yes, there are so many of them. They deserve an unaccented read. Yes. So, Igor Gallenker is a total badass. Right. He is the Associate Chairman for Research in the Department of Psychiatry at Mount Sinai Beth Israel. He is the founder and director of the Family Center for Bipolar uh, and of the Mount Sinai Suicide Research Laboratory also based at Mount Sinai, Beth Israel. And as of 2014, he's a professor of psychiatry at the ICANN School of Medicine in New York City. And he also recently wrote a book called The Suicide Crisis, published in 2017. Yes, actually, uh, uh, one other thing is that he presented very impressively at the American Psychiatric Association meeting in 2018 on this topic. Essentially, he is one of the top authorities. Yeah, he's got on, a fucking Wikipedia page. <laughs> yes, he actually has a Wikipedia page. He does? Yes. Yeah, no, he's been quoted by like the New York Times and yes. CNN and all that shit. So he happens to be a super nice guy. And also, unbeknown to Master McMaster, when he was in Moscow, he held a PhD in chemistry from Moscow University. Uh -huh. And then he came here to the United States, uh, went to the medical school at Mount Sinai graduated this medical school, did his residency training at Mount Sinai. So he is a super uh, gifted, close to a genius kind of a guy. There's so many credentials, we uh, can't even list them all. A very nice person, <laughs> too. Very nice person. So on that note, let's hear from Dr. Gallenker uh, and his infinite wisdom on the topic of suicide. I would like to warn people who are suffering from depression or bipolar disorder and either had history of suicide thoughts or plans or attempts to, in my opinion, not listen to this episode because I'm afraid that it might trigger them. But, of course, we are leaving it to your discretion. I just wanted to warn you as a physician that it must be a triggering experience for you. There's, there's a lot to unpack here. So yes. use your discretion. And without further adieu, I give you... Dr. Eager Gallinger. Keep your brains wide open. Suicide is a very uh, serious problem, uh, I mean, clinically and philosophically in every, in every possible way. And the reason I started working on it is that at one point we had a very prominent psychiatrist giving a talk in our department. And there was a lot of work that was done on suicide with regard to serotonin impulsivity and biology of suicide. But there was one question that was puzzling me. The question is, you know, we deal as psychiatrists with suicidal people all the time. In fact, everybody who is admitted to inpatient psychiatric unit, half of those people are suicidal. 
And uh, the question is, so if a suicidal person walks into your office, I mean, do we have a way, a way of knowing what's going to happen to that suicidal person after they leave your office? Yeah, Can, that would be amazing. Yeah. So, because we as psychiatrists, we deal with people who are at high risk for suicide. They have mental illness, which is one of the highest risk factors long term. They have previous suicide attempts quite often. They have suicidal ideation. And yet, in the United States of 300 million people, probably 8, 8 million people have suicidal ideation every year. And maybe 500,000 people attempt suicide. And 40,000 people kill themselves. Do we know and do we have a way of knowing as psychiatrists? Um, uh, when a person, suicidal person, leaves your office, can we tell who we're not going to see next time? Can we predict suicide short term? Do you know what's going on? Do you know what's in people's heads, okay, ultimately, before they kill themselves? And the answer was no. And, and the reason we started working on, actually, in suicide, both clinically and in research, is to define, find and define the syndrome of acute suicidal crisis. And uh, this would be a syndrome, a state of mind, define a state of mind that a person would have that would distinguish those who would go on to kill himself, like within a week, from those who may never kill himself or kill himself in a year or two years, because this is when we need to act. And the book, uh, The Suicidal Crisis, is a reflection of our work on that and our work on finding the syndrome, because we, we did. It's called The Suicide Crisis Syndrome. And that now, I think, allow us, allows us to tell who is uh, or who is not an imminent danger. So how can you tell? We have a proposed DSM criteria for suicide, The Suicide Crisis Syndrome. It's actually in the book. And um, if this talk is for clinicians... This talk is for the millennials. For, mil for the millennials, okay. And, well, if the millennials... The suicide crisis syndrome is actually a fairly clear entity, and you don't need to have to be a doctor, actually, uh, 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 to be able to tell who is in danger. Okay. And it's not what something uh, typically what we think about. So, the central issue... Okay, the central issue in suicide crisis syndrome and the central concept is that of entrapment, of being trapped in an impossible uh, life situation from which a person wants to escape and all the routes to escape are blocked. And this would involve some kind of humiliating defeat, which could be in business, romantic rejection, which uh, they feel that cannot be corrected, loss of personal health or self in some way that cannot be, cannot be restored, from which there is no escape. A lot of people who, and one of the reasons, by the way, that we know little about suicidal crisis is because uh, there was an assumption, which is, was unproven, that suicidal ideation actually leads to attempt, exactly. leads to behavior. Uh, and there are two problems with that. I mean, one is that, uh, again, a lot of people do not have suicidal ideation until 10-15 minutes before the attempt, when it's too late and there's nobody around. So the syndrome itself appears way before that and comes and goes and fluctuates and can be discernible. But suicidal ideation is present maybe cross-sectionally, maybe 30% of people. Okay, active, acute, conscious suicidal ideation that they report. And the second reason uh, is that why uh, asking about suicidal ideation is a problem uh, is because people who are invested in suicide and thinking about it are not going to be honest with you and they're not going to tell you. Another surprise to anybody who was taught psychiatry before this conversation when they tell us that the majority of people who commit suicide give out warnings. So you are saying it's not the case. They give out warnings, but they're indirect warnings. Indirect warnings. I mean, they're not... Okay, people who say, oh, I feel so bad, I'm going to kill myself, okay, are not going to. But the person who says, obviously, do not know what happened with Zach, that mm -hmm. you mentioned, um, uh, but I'm familiar with why scientists kill themselves, I mean, with the reasons. And the reasons is, uh, you know, if you're invested in a science project, and the science project is not going anywhere, and your career is in science, and your grants are being cut off, and that's the only way you saw success, and there's no alternative for you 
like working uh, as a let's say as a PA or or a nurse or something like that, that it's unacceptable. It's not acceptable. Then this is the situation of entrapment. Okay, and people would tell you, I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go from here because there's no there's no exit. There's no good solutions. Now, that's a warning. So and then so that's the central part. With that, there are certain changes in the person's mind. Okay, that happened. And the first change is affective affective discontrol, meaning uh, inability to control your emotions, which can come in uh, about three or four different ways, but at least one of them must be present. And it is either a state of anxiety, heightened anxiety or panic, or rapid changes in mood, okay, or acute anhedonia, which means that acute inability to experience anything is pleasurable. People who have it chronically and kind of pessimistic and the glass uh, is always half empty uh, are, are not necessarily like that. The people who were able to, and they are currently are not, and cannot even imagine that anything that they liked before would ever give them any sense of pleasure satisfaction. So that's affective discontrol. So that's one aspect of it. The other one is, the second one is loss of cognitive control. Okay. And um, that is a loss, people lose ability to control what's happening in their heads and what they think about. For instance, in the situation that I described to you, hypothetical situation with the scientist, what would be going through his mind is that uh, my career is over, I don't know what to do, uh, what am I do? What did I do to get to this point? And the person will be thinking about it. And if you ask them, can you stop doing that? Okay, they would say, no, I can't. Do you try to do that? And they say, well, I try. And how do you try? Well, I try to talk to people. And what happens is that when the moment I stop talking to people, it comes back with a vengeance and it gets worse and worse. So that's loss of cognitive control. And there's certain rigidity in that thinking is that when you try to intervene and open the doors for them and say that, you know, you can actually do this or that, including changing career completely, they can't. They can't get out of this circle. It feels like a vortex that sucks you. This is actually a form of thought disorder, loss of, loss, loss of cognitive control. And uh, it's close to psychosis in a way. And that's treatable. One of the things that is treatable together with affective discontrol when somebody is suicidal. So it's the second component. It has to be there. So their mind is trapped, yeah. essentially. Yes. Total entrapment. Yeah. No way out. Yes. No desire to get out. Uh, no, there is a desire to get out. The roots are blocked. You can't... There, you, you, you see, no you way see out. No, mm -hmm. no way out. So the third aspect of it is, uh, would be emotional pain. Okay, which is kind of related to entrapment and is close. And it is a feeling, we called it actually emotional pain, in a sense that uh, it's really almost like an ache that you feel, in the sense of pain that you want to escape from. A lot of people actually who are suicidal in the States tell you that uh, I just want it to end. I want my pain to end. And they see no way to end, uh, to end the pain. In fact, this loss of cognitive control that I described to you and this swirling of thoughts in the head so intense that they can actually give people headaches, okay, feeling that, uh, you know, head pain and the headache is going to explode from this and they can't, can't stop it. So that's another component. So two more components. One is over arousal, okay, and it is that people become uh, agitated and lose sleep, okay. There's certain franticness, I mean, to them. And that's, there is no coincidence that uh, most of the uh, suicides occur at night mm -hmm. and because people can't sleep. And this is where the ruminative flooding and these thoughts and everything that uh, I told you about takes control over them. So they lose their sleep, they keep thinking and thinking right. and thinking about it, right. feel trapped and... Yeah. You know. And uh, this last thing, which is uh, probably the least prominent but still needs to be there, is that people withdraw. Not everybody withdraws. In fact, there's a, like that you described as your uh, uh, classmate, is that sometimes, uh, in fact, quite often, but often, I would say not quite, but often enough, people say, but I just saw him yesterday and he looked exactly the same. And they were laughing and smiling, etc. And in fact, uh, the suicide uh, suicides that I had to deal with in my career, people were seen 15 minutes before the suicide attempt smiling. Really? Yeah. On the unit, on the inpatient unit. So this is the suicide crisis syndrome. 
Uh, and, you know, obviously, doctors need to uh, be able to appreciate it. And uh, so here at Mount Sinai, we actually teach you know, doctors how to evaluate uh, the suicide, suicide crisis. And we'll see what difference uh, it makes. Uh, but again, it is simple enough, I mean, and kind of distinct enough, that a person, uh, a lay person who is worried about their loved one can actually assess. And uh, if you have 15 seconds to assess, you can ask two and a half questions and you, uh, it will give you an idea. What are the questions? And the questions are, one, uh, do, you feel, do you feel trapped okay, in your life situation? Is, are there good options for you? And if the answer is uh, yes, and then is that, are you thinking about it a lot? And uh, the answer would usually be yes, and that, can you stop it? Can you stop your thinking, particularly at night? And the answer is, uh, you know, I keep thinking about it. there's nothing I can do and I can't sleep. Okay, then uh, you have somebody who has uh, at least three components of the suicide crisis syndrome right there. So what do you do to save them? Isolation and disconnectedness from, from, from people is a very uh, important factor here. And uh, the fact that somebody cares could be critical, and that could be even an uh, automatic text message from somebody. Ridiculously, uh, almost ridiculously, so that helps and it works. The most effective means that we have right now is a safety plan. And a safety plan is something that a person is connected with somebody and somebody is checked on them on a regular basis, sometimes every 30 minutes, okay, if they need to be to make sure that they're okay and they need to reach out, they need to be wanted. And in the course of the safety plan of the 48 hours after you have a situation like this, if you, you may or may not hospitalize a person, by the way, uh, for that, you may want to help reduce the ruminations with antipsychotics and you have, uh, may help reduce the anxiety and panic if they, if they have that uh, with anti-anxiety drugs. That's for a doctor to do. Right. But for a layperson, should we say they should stay with them and call 911 or...? The thing about the layperson is that they're not in a position to treat. Of course. Okay. And they cannot take the burden upon themselves, the burden of responsibility to treat. And it would be the wrong thing to do. So when you have a friend uh, like that, I mean, uh, you, to the extent possible, you can really need to urge them to either go to the emergency room or to talk to somebody like immediately. So the doctors could implement the safety plan. Before uh, we stop talking about suicide, which is a huge issue, I guess, what advice can you give to people? What can they take away from this conversation in their daily life? What should they do if they know somebody who feels suicidal or they suspect might be thinking about killing themselves? First, the most important thing is that suicide death is a final exit. Okay, and real suicidal intent can be 10-15 minutes long. If you pass that moment, if you get a person out of this moment, you may be saying saving a life. You will save a life. People who survive near lethal suicide attempts often don't go on. I mean, to uh, uh, to kill themselves. So most important thing is first understand that it's the entrapment. Okay, and this is what you have to uh, buy time, ask for help. Don't leave a person alone, but get them to the professionals. Phew! Yeah. <laughs> Actually, I can tell you that uh, during the interview with him, I discovered for myself a lot of amazing things. For example, during the residency training, for example, and it's written in most of the books, that there are certain things that are likely to prevent people from committing a suicide, like having children. But what about a recent event? in France with a very famous person who huh? had a two and a half years old daughter. I don't know what you're talking Bourdain. about. Oh, Anthony Bourdain. Yes. Yeah. So Kate Spade had a daughter as well. Right. So Dr. Gonker said that the only thing that definitely predicts the least likelihood of a person committing a suicide if if a person is religious. I mean, it's not surprising to hear, but I never thought about it that way. Um, so, 
not that, not that I recommend everybody to drop everything and run to, to the nearest church uh, or a mosque or a synagogue. You know, you can run wherever you want, but, but I personally don't recommend that. <laughs> well, it's everybody's uh, decision. and You run uh, wherever you want, brainstormers. Yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so, yeah, so, you know, all of this shit can be hard to listen to, but it's all, like, weirdly rewarding because it's such an important topic. And... This kind of information, I feel like, really helps put things in perspective. Yes, I agree. So, you know, we can get a better understanding of the problem and, like, where to go from there. Yeah. So, if I had to suggest a single message, like a takeaway message from everything that was discussed with Dr. Gallinker, is that if you know somebody who is in trouble, in a bad shape, and is kind of hinting to trying to hurt themselves, don't leave them alone until they get professional I want to say it again, professional help. The civilians, so to speak, are not equipped, but you should be present. And I wouldn't let anybody to stay alone if they are commenting on how suicidal they are. Not a good idea. Yes. Well, you've, you've heard it from both professionals. And we've heard, so far, we've heard a lot of details and a lot of information from the professionals. And... Uh, but we also got a chance to hear from someone who has experience with suicide on the other end of things. So we got to speak to Caitlin, a suicide attempt survivor, who tells us about her experience with her suicide attempt and her inspiring recovery. So let's hear from Caitlin. And keep your minds open. And if you are one person and have only one mind, Keep that thing open, too. Keep it open. Yes. All right. We are here with a very special guest, Miss Caitlin Coleman. Caitlin, will you introduce yourself? Yeah, sure. I am a suicide attempt survivor. Um, I attempted about a month before I turned 20, uh, December 2002. So it's, it's been a journey getting uh, back on track. And I also uh, volunteer with an attempt survivor project called Live Through This, which is a series of uh, portraits and stories of suicide attempt survivors uh, to told in their own words. Very uh, cool. Maybe you could tell us a little bit more about the project okay. and how people can reach it. Okay, so the uh, website, uh, which is currently being revamped, but it's still there, is called livethroughthis.org. Um, it's run by a woman named Desiree Stage, who is also a suicide attempt survivor. And I've been involved with this project for... Six and a half years about, oh, and wow. yeah, I actually um, found out about it um, kind of when it was in its infancy through um, a friend of mine that was uh, also a former coworker. Um, she and I used to, you know, chat at work and everything when it was slow, and um, one day she told me about a project that a friend of hers was starting. Um, her friend Desiree had wanted to do this photography attempt survivor project. And I went to the website, and I think at the time there were maybe four or five portraits up. Just, you know, it was very, very small. And um, I contacted Desiree. I said, you know, I, I got your name from my friend Meg. I'm really interested in, in participating in this. And this was probably, I want to say, like late 2011, early 2012, like December, February, that, that kind of area. And um, she got back to me. I met up with her, and she basically just asked me to tell my story in my own words. And then afterwards, after we had just had that discussion, we went outside and she took a portrait of me. So her work is about kind of getting that look in your eyes after you've just kind of relived that experience and told your story and um, kind of taking away the stigma of, you know, this is a horrible thing, this is a shameful thing, but also attaching um, real world faces and names. You know, it's strictly voluntary, but... These are pictures of us. We all use our first and last names. It's, you know, it's kind of making you less of a statistic and more of a, a person. That's amazing. Uh, do you feel like sharing your story with us? Oh, yeah, of course. Um, you know, to an extent, I think there's certain things that you um, shouldn't talk about. Well, of course. You know, I'm very comfortable. I'm very open. If Once, you know, the mic is off, I'll tell you every dirty detail if you want to know. <laughs> um <laughs> Because I don't, I don't really have a problem with it. Right. But in general, it's been thought, um, it's been proven in the media that if you go into detail discussing method, 
right. that can actually lead to further suicides. It can, yes. You yes. know, so um, so let's not do it. So yeah. let's not do that. Yeah. But I will say that um, physically, the after effects were uh, pretty severe. I was in the hospital for about uh, two weeks. I had to have dialysis. Um, when they were intubating me, they went too far and collapsed my lungs, so I had to have a, a chest tube. I'm a singer, and um, there was a vent on my vocal cord, so that caused a, a what are known as intubation granulomas. I didn't sing for about three years. Um, I'm also a pianist, and I had um, nerve damage because I'd fallen asleep on my arm, and there's something called a radial nerve palsy where it, like, if you, you know, kind of fall asleep a dead weight on a certain appendage, like if you fall asleep naturally, you move around and you kind of wake up if your limb falls, starts right. to fall asleep. But if you're in like a kind of comatose state, you don't really wake up and notice that and your uh, blood flow gets cut off. So, um, yeah, I was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. And then after that, um, the doctor who had admitted me uh, committed me to a psych ward. And then after that, I, um, I can of my release from the ward was that I had to attend a day program, which was actually very helpful. Mm -hmm. um, one thing that I'm really lucky was that I was college at the age at the time, so I was covered my, my parents' insurance, and they had very good insurance. So, I mean, you know, it was still horribly expensive for them, um, but, but that was a uh, help that I was able to get really good care. It, it wasn't a picnic. It wasn't a walk in the park, but I was able to get things that were very helpful to me. So it's a good thing that you are still alive, right? Yes. <laughs> you are, I think it's a you are happy thing. to be alive. I'm very I'm very happy, but it's it's not an overnight thing, you know. Oh, of course. So I'm presuming and it's for you to tell us whether uh, it's true or not that at the moment when you decided to go through with it, it was the only way to deal with whatever you had to deal with, correct? Yes. Um I felt like at at the time it was my only option. I felt like I didn't have anything else. You know, I couldn't have done anything else. In your experience talking to other people, is it common for people to feel that way? I think so, yeah. I mean, in, once you, uh, you know, everybody has a different experience and a different story, but I think there's a lot of commonality in that you feel kind of like there's no escape. There's also a somewhat common feeling of, um, at least in my case and some other people that I've talked to, and that you're a burden and people would be better off without you. Um, but there definitely is that, desperation kind of the walls closing in of i can't do anything else right now this is the only thing and and when you get that tunnel vision it's almost impossible to to see anywhere else in front of you so if you were to tell all of us what could have been helpful at that moment would it be helpful to have a person who you could talk to what would work to prevent it um it's a it's a tricky question because i feel like sometimes <laughs> there's nothing you can do, and that's a horrible answer. Um, but I feel like sometimes if someone has made up their mind to harm themselves, there's not necessarily, you know, aside from maybe putting them in a hospital or physically restraining them, which is, you know, it's, it's a depressing answer. I think, you know, if somebody had maybe knocked on the door or called on the phone, that might have staved it off and maybe gotten me out of the scary point. Um, but you can't always predict. And I think a lot of um, I think a lot of lost survivors, which is a lost survivor is someone who has loved, uh, lost a person to suicide. I feel like there's, there's anger, but they also blame themselves. And they think, oh, if I had been in the room, I could have done this. Or if I had called, I could have done this. And yeah, to an extent, you maybe could have done something. But if, if somebody is that determined to, to harm themselves, sometimes there isn't anything you can do. And a lot of people don't want to hear that. <laughs> You know, I had to deal, due to my profession, I'm a psychiatrist, with a number of cases in which uh, lost survivors do exactly what you just said. And also, in some cases, uh, the question is whether a psychiatrist or a psychologist who was involved with this person could have done anything different. And uh, at some point, uh, I spoke to a person who has done a lot of research in this area and who suggested that the overwhelming feeling in that case of a person who goes through is a feeling of entrapment, which mm -hmm. you basically mentioned. Right. And having somebody around pre preventing them from going through with the plan mm -hmm. sometimes could be helpful. I, I agree, yeah. I just, you know, it, there's a, the concept of free will. I remember um, when I got out of uh, the hospital, you know, I ended up uh, moving back in with my parents for about a year and a half. And when I first got out, um, you know, there was a, 
a counselor that spoke with my parents kind of saying like, this is how you, you know, these are some helpful steps. And um, I can't remember which one, but one of my parents had asked the counselor, you know, what do I do? Do I, do I hide all the medicine? Do I hide all the knives and this and that, which I, is a completely valid question. And the counselor said to um, whichever one of my parents it was at the time, well, it might make you feel better, but it won't make a bit of difference to Caitlin. <laughs> which, you know, is kind of... You agree with. I, I do and I, I don't. You know, I think that... I'm not saying that you should not try to help people. I think this is something that needs to constantly be discussed, not just in the wake of, you know, tragedy or, or news or whatever. I think it's something we have to constantly be talking about. But at the same time, if... If somebody is is determined to do something, there might not always be um, a pr- something you can do. True. So when they committed you to the hospital, mm-hmm. you think it was the right thing to do at the moment? Um, I mean, it scared the crap out of me. I'd never even like visited um, a psych ward. Yes. And I was also extremely young. I was a, m- a month away from turning twenty, so I was one of the youngest people there. Because right. if I'd been eighteen, I would have gone to a peds ward. But right. Um, you know, I think at the time it was, um, what they, what they needed to do. I don't know that it was necessarily helpful because I was very, very scared and pretty much hid in my room the entire time. I do think, um, that the day program that I did afterwards was very helpful. So what I'm trying to get to is this, somebody basically forced you into what, uh, they call and we call in psychiatry in quotes, safe environment. Yes. Are you saying you didn't feel safe there? No, I was just really scared. I didn't, I didn't feel like I was going to be harmed. Right. I was just young and had never been in that environment before and, you know, had seen, like, Girl Interrupted and, you know, when I was in high school. But I was like, I didn't, you know, I basically, in my mind, I was like, oh, my God, I'm going to be about, around a bunch of crazy people. And, you know, it's, it's very intimidating. Well, but the idea there is that because you are supervised by professionals who actually know what to do and how to talk to people, yes, it's a significantly better environment than leaving you with, let's call them civilians. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> I, I agree. The civilians who are inexperienced and yes. uh, might actually do more harm than good by mm-hmm. overreacting, becoming hysterical. <laughs> You know, stuff like that. So when we talk about the safe environment, we are talking about a situation when uh, people who are trained can make sure that you are still alive. Yes. What resources would you like to tell us about uh, right at the start of this program that people who do feel suicidal can utilize? I mean, obviously, there's the uh, National Suicide Prevention Hotline. Okay. So what else do you think people need to hear from you as a survivor? that would help them to deal with the situation they can potentially be in? I would say that um, it, it does get better. Sometimes, you know, not overnight, not automatically. I would say I was probably about two years out before I ever started feeling like kind of okay. And here you are 15 years later. Now, no, now I feel awesome. Yeah. I'm great. <laughs> I'm the best. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I'm sure those two years seemed yeah, like and it a, was it a was really time. rough. And yeah. I feel like people, you know, think that you, it's, it's not like you just wake up and you're like, oh my God, I'm so happy that didn't work. You know, <laughs> people, people attempt for a reason. People feel desperate for a reason. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm sure there are people who do uh, wake up or whatever and are like, you know, immediately regret what they did I, w- I was not in that place i was still very unhappy i was still feeling very despondent and i was also feeling like you know a giant failure and a disappointment you know because i had you know had to had to leave college because of this i felt like i was a disappointment to my parents to my family to my teachers especially because growing up i was you know the smart kid and, and all that mm-hmm. so <laughs> what do you think is the biggest public misconception about suicide and mental health i think the biggest uh misconception about suicide is that it's selfish Mm, yeah i think a a big thing that it's it's not an uncommon reaction but i think a lot of um people who are lost survivors or people who are friends and family of people who have attempted there's this common thing of how could this person do this to me how could Mm. this person leave me and you don't have that with other manners of death you don't say 
how could you have a heart attack? How could you get hit by a car? How could you get cancer? Um, and, you know, to kind of flip the selfish thing on its head, I my argument to that is, well, I think it's selfish of you to expect a suffering person to stick around and make you happy. Yeah. So. You'd be surprised to learn that actually a lot of relatives mm -hmm. of people who died, period, still at the heat of the moment, crying, say, how could you have done it to me? So that's a very common sentiment. Uh, when a person goes away, leaves this planet, dies. Oh, definitely. I mean, uh, I was, you know, freaked out when my grandmother died, and she was 92 and had Parkinson's. But I right. don't think there's the level of, of anger with something like that than there is with something that's, you know, self-inflicted. What do you think is maybe the most important thing that the public should know about suicide? Um, that it doesn't matter what socioeconomic class you are, doesn't matter how successful, how rich, how poor, it, it touches everybody. And I think the um, important thing is to, to keep talking about it because one of my big pet peeves um, is that I feel like people only talk about it when someone famous dies or when something big happens. It's kind of similar to you know, the whole uh, gun thing. It's this uh, cyclical nature of, you know, some, but something horrible happens, and then everybody talks about it for two or three weeks, and everyone, you know, lots of opinions, and then that dies down, and then the next horrible thing happens. Right. And I think it's something that we should constantly be discussing. Yeah. Is there anything we should be doing differently to help people to stay alive? I think just listen to people. I think... Don't make people uh, feel ashamed. You know, if, if someone comes to you and says, I'm depressed, don't tell them, oh, you know, well, but you're so smart. You have so much potential. You're, you have a good job. Or, you know, conversely, you're, you're not depressed. You're just lazy. I got, I got that one in my time. That was a, uh, that yeah. was a fun one. <laughs> that is actually very common in immigrant families. Uh, oh, yeah? <laughs> I mean, clearly, I immigrated from Russia, Russian <laughs> accent. I'm from Moscow. <laughs> And I can tell you that I'm surrounded by highly educated people. I'm a doctor. I immigrated uh, when I was 33 years old. Mm -hmm. 33 years old, like Jesus. <laughs> and uh, <That's> beautiful. <laughs> I was a doctor already at that time. And uh, I can't even begin to tell you how many people around me, even people who know, all of them know that I'm a psychiatrist, tell mm -hmm. me, oh, Schultz, what you're doing is ridiculous. I mean... <laughs> Is there such a thing as depression? People are just lazy. They can easily get over it. And when you talk to immigrant families of immigrants from Korea, mm -hmm. China, these groups of people will tell you very frequently that their parents basically never appreciated uh, that uh, they might have any kind of a problem. Mm -hmm. The best thing that they can hear from them that it's manipulation, but people even not sophisticated enough to say manipulation. Mm -hmm. So it's not culturally acknowledged as a legitimate problem. Yes. So basically, get over it. Snap mm -hmm. out of it. <laughs> right, right. You know? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I agree. I think we all agree that mm -hmm. we need to discuss these issues. So does your consciousness have more questions? <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think another pervasive idea is that the only people who contemplate suicide are people who are severely depressed. Um, Caitlin, as an attempt survivor, and Dr. Schultz as a psychiatrist, um, what are your thoughts on that opinion? Um, I mean, I think that's just very, very broad and very generalizing. Um, I certainly do have depression. I've had it since I was 16, and I was very depressed at the time I attempted. But there's, you know, outside factors. There's, you know, isolation. There's, you know kind of feelings of desperation, feeling alone. Um, I, I think it's really hard to overgeneralize and pinpoint it on, on any one thing. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like saying that you attempted because, I don't know, you had a cold or something. It's, that's a really horrible, horrible analogy. But <laughs> uh, the point is, I think that, you know, you can be depressed and attempt, but you can also um, just, you know, not know what's going on in your head. You know, you don't have to constantly be upset every day to to get to that point yeah you know, people who are not depressed have suicidal thoughts in my 
I wouldn't even say professional opinion, human opinion. Mm -hmm. Having observed uh, many situations and uh, having lost uh, probably the best friend I ever had to an overdose, mm -hmm. which is a suicide. I think that one of the important things that I would like people to appreciate is that every human being has a right to be, or should I say, has a need to be loved and accepted the way they really are. I remember when my children were very little, I don't know, 10, 11 years old, I have two daughters who are grown-ups right now. They would mm -hmm. ask me, you know, how they play with you. Pa. So if I became, uh, I don't know, a porn star, would you still love me? And I will tell them, of course, because you're my daughter. Right. I love you unconditionally, no matter what happens to you. Please tell me that your 10-year-old daughter actually asked you if you would accept them if they became a porn star. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe she wasn't 10, maybe she was 12 or 13. It doesn't really matter. But yeah. <laughs> yeah, but you, you, know, you know what I mean. And it's totally uh, weird to me even with my uh, Soviet Union background, I immigrated from the Soviet Union where gays and lesbians were incarcerated, essentially. And yeah. still, it's like, it's like, in quotes, bad. I don't understand how people can get rejected by their parents for having a different sexual orientation, uh, feeling that their identity is different, wanting to have some changes in their life, or not pursuing a career that their parents want. And... I could name an enormous amount of sometimes very crazy things. I can tell you that even a person who is actively using and is stealing from parents, mm -hmm. it happens, and maybe even committing crimes, still wants to be loved. And no matter how bizarre this idea sounds to probably a large number of people, there needs to be somebody who loves them. Mm -hmm. There is a Beatles song about it. <laughs> no, Queen. Want somebody to love. Queen. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yes. Yeah, Queen. Somebody to love. Queen. Yes, let's let the real singer. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Queen. So, Queen, yeah, Freddie Mercury. Yeah, so maybe, uh, maybe it sounds like I'm uh, kind of making it up, but I'm not. I'm really of a very strong belief that human beings and animals, let's say our pets, <laughs> have to be loved. So in my experience, one of the important things that I see again and again is what hap is the following situation happening. A person is not feeling right, feeling trapped. Entrapment is, as Dr. Gallenker told us during the interview, is one of the main factors that lead people to suicide. Mm -hmm. Why don't we make uh, people's life a little bit easier and accept them for what they are? I think that it would be a back step forward. Not that it's going to remove all the suicide attempts in the world and all the problems in the world, but certainly it would be nice to be supportive of somebody. Yeah, sure. I think, Dr. Schultz, what you're trying to say is not that, not that if someone attempts suicide that it's because their family members and their loved ones didn't show them enough affection. I think right. what you're saying is that if we're looking for solutions as to how to prevent this kind of thing from happening as frequently as it's been happening, that one thing that we can all do right. is just care for each other mm -hmm. and show that, that care and love. Yeah, but I would, like to, I would also like to make a specific point is that very frequently what happens in life is that a person... Generally speaking, not necessarily a person who goes through with the suicide plan, feels that there is nobody to talk to, mm -hmm. that people close to them who are supposed to be their friends, who are supposed to be supportive of them, are not the kind of people you want to talk about your some kind of a problem, whatever that is. And uh, is it normal human behavior for parents to be critical of their children? I think it is. I think, uh, I hope, uh, attempts can be made to combine this kind of criticism right. with uh, a person feeling that they still can share with you, mm -hmm. somebody. 
I think there's also a big element of, of not wanting to to disappoint anyone, not wanting to yes. let anyone down. And, you know, I remember when I was younger, when I was in my late teens, early 20s, there was this kind of thing of, oh, we don't talk about this. And Whereas nowadays, I'm just like, I will tell you every single thing. And part of it is because I, I don't believe I have anything to be ashamed of. I don't think I did anything wrong. But I also, um, ever since being in, involved with Desiree's project, Live Through This, you know, I feel like you can help other people who have been through the same thing just by talking about it. You know, before I got involved with her thing, I remember thinking like, kind of now that I was in a functional place, like a few years after I moved to New York, I was like, oh, I'd, I'd really like to talk to someone who is maybe like right out of the hospital, like had been in my position, because I feel like that would have helped me at the time. And, and there was like nothing, you know, there were no resources for that kind of kind of thing but instead there's this big stigma around uh-huh. around the whole thing that makes people afraid to even want to talk about well it. i think and there's a couple factors at play um one thing that i've heard um and it's one of the things that um the afsp like kind of disagrees with is they think oh if we make talking about this okay is it is it going to make people attempt more and i i disagree with that you know it's not something that should be glamorized, of course not, but it's also not something that should be demonized either. There has to right. be a middle ground between saying that it's okay that you feel this way, these are some resources, it's okay that you attempted, you can get better, you know. So just because we're talking about it doesn't mean we're celebrating it, you know? Right. Yes. I also would like to offer people a very, in quotes, original idea, <clears throat> is that this life is the only opportunity we know about Mm -hmm. for our consciousness to feel, to be able to participate, to be able to enjoy life. Maybe there is an afterlife, maybe not. I actually interviewed once a young gentleman, a college student, who did a little bit too much of the shrooms (laughs) and suddenly came to a clear realization that even if there is an afterlife, and even if there is reincarnation, you don't remember anything about it, do you? No. So oh, I spent uh, a lifetime studying yoga. And I remember one of the prominent teachers at the school, uh, by giving a lecture, told people, just remember, nobody lives this life a life. People die. So mm-hmm. to use this gift of nature, consciousness, to participate in this life mm-hmm. is a very good idea but sometimes the consciousness doesn't feel that great <laughs> <laughs> Agreed. Right? so then it would be nice uh to look into what's going on this tendency to have an ultimate solution for everything like black or white mm-hmm. right all or nothing not always seems to be a rational thing to do mm-hmm. says Dr. Schultz, who is almost 63 years old. <laughs> <laughs> so, of course, for someone who is in their 20s, it's probably not the case, and I'm not trying to convince them. So what else do you think is important for us to talk about? I would say just being aware of, of who is around you and to you know, be aware that everyone's feelings are valid, to not say that you shouldn't be like this. You should be ashamed of yourself. You're, you know, you're not just not working hard enough you're not trying hard enough or you shouldn't be feeling what you're feeling because mm-hmm. of x y or z exactly or if you if you are depressed well why don't you just like go on medication why don't you just even if yeah so if people do recognize depression as a legitimate issue and they say like oh well they could have just gone on, on medication they well, could have I just mean, gone to a therapist but it's not always that easy. it's not that easy because our healthcare system is can i say fun? That is one reason, but like also like psychologically, if you're in that state, it's not that easy. It's not that easy. No, I, I mean, I went to a counselor when I was in high school, like for talk therapy, but I wasn't medicated till after I attempted and was in the hospital. And that was like, okay, well, she's here. Let's, you know, get this girl on some medication. And even then, um, I'm on a med right now that I've been on for about 15 years and it works great for me. I love it. But it took like three different tries to mm. to get which medication and what dosage. And that's the thing. It's, it's not exact. And someone else who has clinical depression might not do as well with the same medicine that I have, which I think it's so important to, you know, have um, 
therapy in tandem with medication, especially at the beginning when you're when you're trying to figure that dosage out, you know. And I think it's one thing that's really really important is to begin to, to begin to see your consciousness and your mental health as a necessity and something that's important, you know, with um, healthcare and insurance, you know, if you go to get a pap smear or a prostate exam, or, you know, um, if you're a woman over 40, a mammogram, those are considered essential things, things that you need, things that everybody should have. But if you're, I feel like a lot of people see psychiatric care as a luxury and it's not. Mm, I could not agree more, and thank you very much for bringing it up. Not only do they see it as a luxury, they actually don't see it as necessary. Because it's very easy to appreciate that your heart is important Mm -hmm. and uh, all the other places you mentioned are important. But to me, the fact of the matter is that we are talking right now about it, and our listeners hopefully are listening, Mm -hmm. using our consciousness, which to the best of my knowledge, and Master McMaster will correct me if I'm wrong, is located, housed, and nurtured inside of our brains. I would like to actually ask you a question. Yes, sir. How do you feel about people who don't take off their backpacks when they're on the subway? (laughs) Bastards. Uh, you agree? <laughs> yes. So also what... people who go up the don't who, who stand in the middle middle of the escalator. Unacceptable. Ah. What right. about people who stand in the doorway of the subway instead of moving in so that other people? Yeah, we hate all of them. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Drives me nuts. But we'd like to help, and to receive this help, you might listen to the very first episode when Master McMaster and Doctor Schultz shared. They're real emotions about these issues. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> that was our public service announcement. <laughs> Caitlin, thank you so much for being with us Thank today. you very much. Thank you for having me. Thank you. And that's Caitlin. Yes. First of all, I have to say that Caitlin is a super nice person, uh, fun to be around, very optimistic and upbeat. And... Uh, I'm very impressed with her story. Oh, she's amazing. Yes. I have to tell you that uh, I spent the beginning of my medical career, um, a very short beginning for about probably five months, between me graduating the physician's assistant school in a place of Moscow, which is called Sklifasovsky Institute, pretty much similar to Bellevue here by the intensity of things that, that are happening there, and the medical school. And I worked in a place which was in a very clear way called Poison Control Center. So if somebody decided to kill themselves by poisoning themselves, uh, people would come out. There was a special uh, team of people on a few specially designed EMS cars, which uh, had a doctor and two physician assistants on them and were equipped with a lot of heavy-duty stuff to start treatment right away. Uh, not like in the, not like in the United States, and kind of like in the United States. They also dial zero three there, not nine one one. In every country, it's a different uh, dial. So I worked on a, in a place uh, where they would bring these people to. Of course, we had accidental poisonings, like for example, a funny story. Uh, how do you call a guy who tames uh, lions and tigers? A lion tamer. Uh, in circus. Like, you know, ringleader? They, yeah. Like people who perform with animals in, in like circuses. A carny? No, like, you know, people who, like, you go to the circus and they're trained uh, dangerous, uh, pr- you know, predators. I would just call him a circus performer. So, a circus performer who worked with tigers and he had this tradition after he was done training them or after the performance, he would come out and have a shot of vodka. He also had. Uh, Double hydrogen peroxide, which is a terrible poison, destroys everything it touches. And by mistake, it was put in a vodka bottle. It wasn't a trick to poison him. Nobody wanted to kill him. So he had a shot of that, and they brought him in. Or we had a guy who was probably was a schizophrenic walking outside of Moscow, and so a snake decided to touch it. It bit him. It was a poisonous snake. So periodically we had accidental poisonings, but... Most of the people who came intentionally wanted to kill themselves. And a large percentage of them, I wouldn't lie to you and tell you I remember what percentage survived. And uh, we, we spoke to them on numerous occasions. 
a psychiatrist would come in and talk to them after they were back to and I spoke to them quite a bit. I can tell you without any exception, without any single exception, people told me consistently that in a lot of cases they would wake up uh, before going under completely and would be very sorry that they attempted a suicide. Really? I also spoke to a number of people, which is significantly smaller, who survived uh, jumping um, and also once airborne feel scared and sorry about this. I've heard that. Yeah. So it's a sad situation and I wish people didn't have to come to it, but it happens, unfortunately. It, it does. Master McMaster. Yes. Today. Maybe you can light up our day today and come up with a you dominia moment. You know, I think I, I think I can. Despite the very dark nature of the topic, I think we can find something so inspiring in um, particularly what Caitlin said. So much of Caitlin's advice reminds me of what we spoke about for our discussion on the stigma of sexual assault. And I think it really rings true for like all mental health issues. Uh, people need to feel safe enough to be honest. And that safety needs to come from an open, non-judgmental community. And, you know, in this dark corner of the world of mental health, I think that's a really positive thing that we can take with us and try to do like every day to try to make the world a better place as like cheesy as that sounds. Um, you know, I think that's something that's really like in our power to, to do. I agree. It's, it's a very good thing to say by you. And on this positive note, let's, sign out from this episode yes that we all survived everyone survived go get yourself like a chocolate sorbet what's going on you forgot about our favorite medication oh pizza <laughs> right go get yourself some pizza brainstormers what, what, what topping i would do pep pep pepperoni i understand pep uh, pep Pepperoni. I prefer margarita, but mm. whatever. It's a good one. Um, yeah, which reminds me that <laughs> at some point we need to talk seriously to our listeners about food issues. Yes. How food and whether or not food can help with and prevent certain emotional issues. Of course, I suspect that if you were fed pizza three times a day, you would be happy. I would probably be a lot larger than I am now, but I think I would be pretty happy. In Russia, we have a saying, we say that a good person has to be as large as possible. Yes. We want more <laughs> of you. <laughs> oh, God. Okay, I get it now. Um, that is wonderful. Right. And on that truly optimistic note. And very healthy. And very healthy. Signing off, Brainstorm 9000. Keep your brains Open. Goodbye, Earthlings. And listen to us, okay? <laughs>